Um, please take your seats. The first hand raiser, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, it's really quite informative. Uh, you talked a lot about uh, the sort of the UN reaction to uh, the North Korea sort of issue. You know, the, the problem that particularly in recent years has been um, sort of brought forward by North Korea and its nuclear test. Um, just more of a sort of informal question I suppose it's quite interesting how is the uh, how's the North Korean delegation to the UN viewed by other member states in regards to that tension you know is there a particular way in which uh, other member states react to the North Korean delegation well as you might have uh, noticed from my presentation for uh, his historical reasons, um, North Korea is not very big on United Nations, you know. The North Korea is not very enthusiastic about the United Nations. We can, you know, that's understandable because, for example, during the Korean War, they were fighting the United Nations command and the armistice agreement, truce, in 1953, was signed by North Korean commander, Chinese commander, and the United Nations commander, which was actually the United States general. So legally speaking, United Nations command is one party to the Korean armistice. South Korea did not sign it because our then president, Seung Man Rui, insisted that we would continue to fight, so we don't agree to cease fire. So South Korea did not sign the armistice. So legally speaking, the, you know, uh, the United Nations was uh, uh, North Korea's enemy. And also, you know, if, if you recall that uh, North Korea was very reluctant in becoming a UN member, uh, they argued that do the two Koreas should wait until unification and join the United Nations as one nation. But they, uh, you know, they changed their mind because the South Cor because South Korea was about to be admitted to the UN membership, so they joined the UN together with that. So for these reasons, um, usually North Korea maintains uh, quite a low key in dealing with the United Nations. So every September when there is a new session of General Assembly, when you, you just for, saw the photo of the General Assembly Hall, when there, there, when there are a lot of uh, heads of state, um, you know, 40 ministers from member states, usually out of 193 members, at least 130 40 countries are represented by head of state or head of government, president or prime minister. But North Korea always send their vice minister, vice foreign minister, not even foreign minister. But this year, they, they were represented by foreign minister. And I think the, during the recent three years, North Korea was represented by foreign minister. But they never sent their head of government or head of state. And in, as a delegation, they also maintain quite a low key. You know, they come to the UN meetings when it is absolutely necessary. So yeah. delegate seat is quite often empty. Um, but they come to meetings when they need to speak or they need to watch. So I sometimes run into my North Korean counterpart in the UN. I, of course, chat with him in Korean, Korean language. 
but we don't go very substantive, you know, we just exchange greetings, uh, you know, small talks, that's about it. Um, thank you for your presentation. I noticed this might be a kind of a controversial topic, but do you think that lifting the sanctions on North Korea would somehow change the overall situation and their relationship with the UN or other countries in general? Well, the sanctions, sanctions, all the sanctions imposed by United Nations have their purposes. The, the UN um, does not impose sanctions as a punishment. Punishment meaning in, in the domestic context, in domestic, uh, you know, legal judiciary uh, context. If someone committed crimes, he or she, if he or she is sentenced guilty, then he or she serves time in prison, which is punishment. So once you are done with uh, serving in prison, spending time in prison, then your punishment is over, right? So you go back to society. But UN sanctions don't work like that. You know, it's not punishment. It's just means of achieving certain purpose. Every sanction, you have a purpose to impose it. When you adopt resolution, you make clear about why you are imposing these sanctions on a certain country. So in the case of North Korea, they made clear that they are imposing these sanctions so that DPRK, North Korea, would abandon, give up its nuclear and missile programs because having them for North Korea is illegal. So that means you cannot lift sanctions unless the purpose is achieved. If it is a punishment, if you serve a certain time, then you are relieved, right? But this is not punishment. This is just means of achieving a certain purpose. So unless the goal is met, sanctions will not be lifted. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, my question is, um, as you know, uh, after Korean War, the Korea separated into two countries, uh, and many Koreans escaped from the conflict overseas to China, Eurasia, and America. And my family is also part of these families. Um, although overseas Koreans participate in many different cultures, uh, some people lost pieces of their Korean heritage, and because of this, the younger generation overseas Korean have lost connection to the Korean issues, um, such as the split of the Koreas. How can young generation overseas Koreans contribute their awareness and support to most challenging issues today about Koreas in the United Nations? Thank you. Well, um, you know, if you think about your identity, um, you know, uh, we can identify ourselves, for example, uh, according to your citizenship. So if you are a Korean citizen, if you are a U.S. citizen, if you are a Norwegian citizen, you know, you, you belong to a state, right? But we also have different levels of identity. You belong to a, a certain ethnic group, for example, you know. Sometimes it is called nation. So Korean nation, people who have, who belong to Korean ethnic group, there are about 80 million of them. 50 million live in South Korea. 25 million 
live in North Korea. And about 7 million live all over the world as diaspora. I don't know if it is desirable to encourage them to think of themselves as ethnic Korean. But whether it's desirable or not, they are ethnic Koreans, you know. They share the same culture, same history, uh, sometimes same language, you know. S some of them might not be able to speak Korean, but most of them speak Korean. So, whether you like it or not, you belong to this ethnic group, Koreans. And my suggestion is that to take it as it is. You know, if you are a Canadian citizen, Canada is your country. You know, you, 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 I would encourage you to become a faithful Canadian. But it doesn't have to be in conflict with the fact that you belong to the Korean ethnic group, in my opinion. Especially in this globalized world, I think I encourage all of you to have an identity as a global citizen. You know, we all belong to humanity. And thanks to globalization, a lot of issues we are dealing with have to do with the earth, the world, the international community, rather than a certain ethnic group, rather than a certain state, rather than a, a certain group of states. And because culture evolves, you know, our identity expands naturally. When I started out as a diplomat in 1985 in New York City, if you ask some Americans if they eat sashimi, I heard someone re responding to me that, you know, proudly responding to me that I don't eat raw fish. If you do that today in America, if you say I don't eat raw fish, you are probably from Texas. Well, uh, I have nothing against Texas, but um, eating sashimi is no longer something, you know, uh, some decent person don't, doesn't do. Same for kimchi, you know. When I started out, not too many Westerners or Americans ate kimchi. When I was ambassador during the last uh, three and a half years, when I uh, entertained my guests from all over the world, the favorite food item was kimchi. My uh, chef always had to refill their kimchi. Actually, I don't eat much of kimchi myself, but they have to refill kimchi for all the guests, especially from, you know, uh, Western countries, not only Asian. Yeah. Same for karaoke. You know, karaoke is a Japanese invention was improved by Koreans using IT technology. But karaoke is all over the world. Actually, my, the farewell party, my US colleague Samantha Power gave me uh, on the next day after the election, actually. So they were not in good mood. But anyway, uh, they gave me a farewell party at a karaoke bar near uh, the city of New York City. Oh, I never been to that karaoke bar, but obviously Samantha must like that place. So, what all of these mean? You know, we are living in a globalized world. Our cultures evolves, converge with each other. Some people say K-pop music is a kind of a recycle of American pop culture. May be true, but, but there is nothing wrong about recycling others' culture, you know. We, 
we, it is actually desirable that if you recycle others' culture and develop it into something new, improve it. So they recycled very nicely. That's why K-pop is so popular all over Asia. So my suggestion is that you respect all of your identities. If you are Canadian citizen, if you are ethnic Korean, all of them are important for you. And don't lose track of uh, what is happening, you know, in your own country or in your original country. But at the same time, you are global citizen. So it actually doesn't matter whether you are Canadian, Korean, Japanese, American. We are all global citizens. Thank you for your lecture, Professor. So my question is related to the UN peacemaker operation that you mentioned in your lecture. Um, according to a lot of like numerous reports, uh, official reports and news reports, uh, recently the peacemakers um, are committing uh, human rights violation and uh, other like sexual raping and abuse. And so what do you think about it and what, which measures can be taken to solve this problem? Thank you. Actually, they are called peacekeepers, not peacemakers. Uh, we don't have a uh, term uh, peacemaker in the UN. They are peacekeepers. And I briefly explained to you how originally the United Nations was going to have capability to enforce peace. But the UN never got its own army because member states did not cooperate. Uh, member states did not want to place their own troops under the UN's command. So that's how the United Nations invented this new methodology called peacekeeping. Peacekeeping, peacekeepers are composed of uh, troops contributed by member states but they are not peace enforcers. You know, they just keep peace. That means you need uh, to have peace first if you want to keep it, right? So they are not peacemakers. They are not peace enforcers. They are peacekeepers. But as you said, uh, recently uh, there have been these uh, issues about, you know, sexual exploitation and sexual abuse by peacekeepers. Uh, these are very unfortunate instances, but part of the reason why such things happen is because, uh, to, put, to put it bluntly, there is no UN police. You know, the, the UN uh, is a uh, uh, an international organization uh, composed of sovereign member states, but the UN itself is not a world government. The UN does not have law enforcement function. So if someone, you know, all peacekeepers are operating under the instruction of UN Secretary General. So UN Secretary General will never allow such abuses. But if someone, some peacekeeper violated, the Secretary General cannot bring him or her to justice because there is no justice system in the UN. What the Secretary General can do is to requesting their uh, home government to call him or her back and bring him or her to justice. So that's how the, there is this uh, kind of uh, uh, mm, lack of proper uh, judicial uh, arrangement in dealing with uh, violations committed by peacekeepers. 
But the Secretary General, uh, you know, both Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and the current one, Guterres, both of them made clear that, uh, you know, the UN is considering uh, how to uh, strengthen its control of our peacekeepers and how to end impunity. You know, this is a lot to do with impunity. There should be accountability and we should end impunity. Thank you very much for the great presentation. Uh, my question is related to the sanctions and human rights. Uh, well, I'm from Iran and I grew up with sanctions and I saw the effect of sanctions on the people more than on the government basically and I see the sanctions as a punishment for the people rather than burden for the part for the government. Uh, how do you see the sanctions on the North Korea and like on the effect of it on the North Korean people? And do you think these sanctions are considered as a punishment for the Korean, North Korean people to kind of go against their government and try to change the regime? Thank you. Even though the UN sanctions are designed uh, not to affect livelihood of ordinary people, um, but as you pointed out, you know, if your country is under sanctions, then lives of people have to be affected. Uh, they have to suffer from a lot of difficulties, um, you know, uh, lack of proper resources, uh, you know, limited uh, economic activities, all of that. Um, in the case of North Korea, probably, you know, compared to Iraq, for example, um, people's livelihood must be affected much less because the current, um, not only current, but most uh, UN sanctions are targeting the countries economic activities with the outside world. So country like Iraq, that depends a lot on the export of its oil, you know, you are affected a lot by that. Ordinary people on the street of Baghdad are affected by that. But ordinary people on the street of Pyongyang should be much less affected because North Korea's dependency on economic activities, external economic activities, is very limited. So by now, under these sanctions, the North Korean regime must have great difficulty in earning any foreign currency. But in North Korea, for foreign currency, you know, foreign exchange, it's not uh, a necessary item for people on the street. They don't, they don't have a chance to travel outside North Korea. They cannot afford to buy uh, anything imported from foreign countries. Basically, a lot of their life is self-sustained. So that's why targeting uh, economic activities with the outside world in the case of North Korea will probably have limited effects. Because it has limited effects, in other words, it's not very effective. North Korea can continue to defy the sanctions. But as I explained in my presentation, when they are done with uh, tests, bomb and missile tests. And when they decide to turn around, when they decide to go for economic development, the Chinese way, you know, economic reform and openness, so that 
you know, people, someone asked, someone told me that in North Korea last year, per capita GDP rose by 3%. So he said, you know, when per capita GDP rises, what, what's the use of sanctions? I said, no, sanctions are not designed to prohibit uh, a rise in per capita GDP. You know, they can, their per capita GDP can grow just by manufacturing more clothing, more shoes, more socks. But people don't need, people don't live on clothing, socks, and shoes only. People want to have a better life. Better life in today's world means they want to have a smartphone, they want to have LCD TV, make trips abroad. They know what is going on in China, they know what is going on in South Korea. So sooner or later, North Korean regime will have to take care of that. You know, allowing people to survive is not enough. That's when these sanctions will make difference because these sanctions have the effect of virtually cutting off all external economic activities by North Korea. You cannot upgrade living standards of your own people without engaging with the outside world economically. You might be able to survive, you might be able to produce more clothing and shoes and socks, but that don't give people better life. Um, here at the back. Um, uh, well, it was, it was very nice, the presentation, and... Where are you? Here at the back. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, I don't ask this question often, but I could feel kind of your honest efforts to kind of improve things. And I just wanted to, well, two questions. My first question is, what was your mindset when you started this, you know, this road of diplomacy? What drove you to become a diplomat? And um, my second question is, um, well, having said that, I just wanted to ask you a personal question on how has the Korean issue affected you personally? Because, well, you're Korean and, um, I was watching a lot of, not a lot, but uh, some YouTube videos on how um, Korean families, Korean relatives have um, been, well, were reunited after, I, I don't know, 70, 60 years for a couple of hours in some meetings in uh, the DMZ, right? And they were crying so much and they were, because, well, they were crying so much and it must have been very touching for them, right? So we don't have, that kind of, those kind of issues where I come from. And I just want to understand your personal view on how that has affected you. Yeah, those two questions. Thank so you. the second question is about the reunion of separate families. Separate families in South Korea and North Korea. Yeah, more specifically how that has affected you and how this whole thing has affected you personally. Oh, how this whole thing affected me personally. Um, the first question, I decided to become a diplomat, um, um, partly by design and partly by accident. Um, my late father was also a diplomat during his uh, uh, early years. He was Korean consul in Los Angeles during the Korean War. I was not born yet, I was born after the war. Uh, my father met my mother there. My mother was studying at uh, USC, University of Southern California. So they married there and came back to Korea and then I was born. Um, but I wanted to be a journalist until uh, my junior year. But somehow some friends of mine encouraged me to take 
diplomatic exam because even if you don't pass it, you, you must study hard and you will easily uh, become a journalist even if you don't pass diplomatic exam. But I passed it, so I, I became a diplomat. And um, my mother was very happy about it because my father never made an ambassador. My father was only a consul and then he retired early. So my mother was very happy about it. But even though she never saw me become an ambassador, she passed away before I made it. But she knew that I was on the right way. Anyway, that's how I, how I became a diplomat a long time ago. And your, your second question, you know, separate people in South Korea and North Korea. Actually, my late mother was born in North Korea. So, so was my, uh, so were my grandparents uh, on mother's side. And because my mother, after coming back from LA, she started to teach at university. So I was uh, taken care of by my grandmother, who was from Hamgyeongdo pro province in North Korea. She spoke with very heavy North Korean accent. Um, but, I, but somehow I learned the standard Korean. Anyway, um, so my generation, my generation, we know and feel that South Koreans and North Koreans are the same people. There's no differ difference. North Koreans are just like my mother or my grandmother. So we know from our own experience, we know from our own blood. But younger generation these days, their parents were born after the Korean War, like myself. So, you know, they can, they can understand that South Koreans and North Koreans have the same root if they think about it. But they cannot feel it like I do because they don't have a, a mother who was born in North Korea. They were not brought up by grandmother who spoke with heavy North Korean accent. So it's very hard for young generation to feel it, to realize it, even though they can understand it. So understanding is different from feeling it, right? So the reunion of separate families, you know, since year 2000, when it first started, there have been only about less than 20 occasions each occasion of reunion uh, had about 200 people from each side. But actually, there are hundreds of thousand people who have separated family members in the other side of the border. We are not talking about cousins. We are talking about parents, brothers, sisters, sons, and daughters. That's separated families. So if you are meeting your parent for the first time in 60 years at one of these reunions for three days, and you know that you will be separated again for the rest of your life, it's very sad. You know, I once told a story about my father-in-law. You know, my father-in-law is also from North Korea. He came down to South Korea during the Korean War because during the war, there, is no, there was no border. Border was flexible, so they, people could move around freely. And my father-in-law thought, you know, he lived in near Hamhung. He thought, you know, he might be able to get a better job if he looked around in Kangwondo area, where, you know, Pyeongchang Olympic Games will take place. So he came down because there was no border. And then all of a sudden, the uh, armistice negotiation was over. There was no uh, announcement for that until they agreed. So one day, 
they agreed that, oh, we, have, we now have this armistice. So nobody crosses this line from tomorrow. So my father-in-law was stuck in South Korea. You know, he, he said, oh, I just came from the other side of uh, the border. You know, I need to go back to my home. My whole family are there. No, 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 nobody crosses this border from today. You are stuck here. So he waited and waited, but they never allowed anyone to cross back. So he decided to settle in South Korea. He was all by himself because he's a parent and his uh, um, sisters, siblings were all in North Korea. Probably they were waiting. Why, why is he not coming back? You know, he, he said he would come back in a few weeks, but he's not coming back. So he was stuck in South Korea. He married my mother-in-law. That's how my wife was born. Otherwise, I would not have uh, had a wife. But anyway, so my father-in-law, when they started reunion of separate families in year 2000, he applied, of course, you know, he applied for a reunion. Yeah, my family members back in North Korea, you know, I give, you, give their names, so please look for them. You know, I want to have a reunion. But because there were so many people Waiting list was so long, you know, they had computer lottery. My father-in-law was never selected in computer lottery. So he asked, I was a director general in Korean Foreign Ministry. He asked me if I knew anyone in the Ministry of Unification, because Ministry of Unification was doing the lottery. So I went to see a director in the Ministry of Unification. You know, I told him about the case of my father-in-law, uh, you know, which was a very, uh, you know, um, unique case. But he said, I understand fully your father-in-law's situation. But Mr. Oh, there are hundreds of thousand people waiting in the roster. What can I do about it? We run it through computer. So I came back to my father-in-law. I told him that, you know, I talked to this guy, but he says, you know, he cannot do much about it. So my father-in-law was very disappointed. Uh, so we decided to drink some soju. And then, Two years later, he passed away without ever getting selected for family reunion. I told this story to my former colleague, friend, Samantha Power, the US ambassador, over our lunch. And she started to cry after hearing this. And I said, no, no, take it easy, Samantha. I don't know if uh, I don't know if it is good for him or bad for him that he was never selected because if he had been selected he might have been able to meet his parents and siblings for 3 days but he should be separated again for the rest of his life I don't know which is better you know you just assume that they are okay rather than actually meeting them and realizing that they are not okay, you know. It's a sad story, but it's a common story for many Koreans. Um, more? Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you for your presentation. I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so my question, I have two questions, one is about uh, this UN Security Council. So, as you said, there are six members, and most of them are the countries that have been involved in war in World War One and World War Two. So, the mission of the UN Security Council is, I believe, that it should Im eliminate the war. But when we see the background of this country, the history of those countries, they have been involved in, in so many wars. So, how those countries 
which has been involved in so many wars, how they are going to eliminate war. And even recently, in, in today's world, that there are so many wars, they are like indirectly involved. I mean, there are so many proxy wars going on uh, in, the, uh, in the world uh, because of those countries. So what's your view on this? Yep. Uh, that's, that's one question. You said you have two questions. So my, my, second, my, my second question is the UN as a whole, how effective it was to eliminate the three pillars of the UN, human rights development and also peacekeeping or creating peace. Uh, I believe some countries, they are accusing each other and using like human rights and accusing each other. For example, the US is like accusing North Korea to of like abusing human rights or either Russia or even Japan. It's uh, so just because of their their interest in the region and some like rivalry which is going on among them. So how about this? Hmm. First on the Security Council, I would like to suggest that you remember that the United Nations came into being uh, as a kind of as a compromise between ideas and realities. Um, the, the forerunner of the United Nations, which was called uh, League of Nations, failed because they were standing on ideas only, you know. In the League of Nations, all member states have the equal right, equal voting right, and decisions were made by consensus. So if you don't reach consensus, no decision. So the, so the League of Nations was not able to prevent a war. That had the Second World War. So the United Nations is based on the lessons learned from the failure of League of Nations, so they tried to make it more realistic, so that great powers have greater privileges in decision making. Otherwise, these countries would not come to the UN if they have the same right as any other country, a small country. So from the beginning, they had this permanent five in the Security Council, you know, as I said, Security Council is the most powerful organ in the UN. And inside the Security Council, they made sure that five countries, all of them victors of the Second World War, five countries have privileges in decision making. They can veto any decision by the Security Council. But depending on what you think, you know, whether that was a good arrangement, whether the Security Council has been able to prevent another war. There was no third world war so far. So if you think, well, the Security Council has prevented a third world war, then it was successful. But if you think, no, there was too many wars, too many small conflicts, some of them even not small, big conflicts. So the Security Council was not able to stop them. So it's not a success story. Well, so, so be it. It's your, your car. Um, but still, you know, you have this lingering question whether it was the right way of reflecting reality in the Security Council. I mean, designating five countries having their names in the UN Charter so that these countries will have privileges forever as long as the United Nations exists. Is that a good idea? Because, you know, times change and power changes. Even if a certain country was uh, one of the most powerful five countries in the world as of 1945, are you sure that country is still among top five as of 2017. You are not sure. But whether you are sure or not, you cannot change it. 
you cannot do much about it. So they are talking a lot, of, lot about reform of the Security Council, reform of the United Nations, but it's not an easy uh, issue. And as you said, some of P5 sometimes are engaged in conflicts. Sometimes they are even responsible for some conflict. So even so, you cannot do much about it. That's reality. And so it has been a compromise between reality and ideas. I think it's going to be an uh, evolving process, you know. The, after all, the UN is uh, what we, uh, uh, you know, UN is just like uh, we, uh, we want it to be. So if all of us want to change it, the United Nations, it will have to change. But it's very hard to get consensus in the UN, especially if you need to uh, be based on both reality and ideals. And your second question, you know, other pillars like human rights. Um, in the UN, the, the only binding decisions are made on issues of peace and security, or other issues, economic issues. You know, I was uh, president of uh, Economic and Social Council. So economic issues, social, social issues, human rights issues, all these issues, the United Nations come up with a lot of resolutions and decisions, but they are not binding. Uh, basically, recommendations. Only Security Council can make binding decisions. So when it comes to human rights, the approach taken by the United Nations is often called naming and shaming. So you name them and discuss them, and you shame them with an expectation that they would change because they don't want to be shamed. But what if, if they don't mind being shamed? Then it's not effective, you know? So, for example, North Korea just shrugged it off when the Human Rights Council or General Assembly adopted the annual resolutions on its human rights situation. But North Korea got sensitive after the report of uh, Michael Kirby, COI, Commission of Inquiry. Why? Because that report suggested that the North Korean case should be brought to International Criminal Court. International Criminal Court is actually a very interesting innovation that came about about 15 years ago. Because International Criminal Court can indict persons, even heads of state, if they commit crimes under their jurisdiction and send them to jail. There are former heads of state who are in jail in The Hague. North Korea knows that, so when this issue came to a new dimension, thanks to this uh, COI report, North Korea got very sensitive, and they tried to defend themselves that there is no human rights violation in North Korea. That's what we want from the countries, naming and shaming. By discussing it, we want to see sensitive response from these countries. Because on human rights issues, there is no binding decision by the UN. The best we can do is naming and shaming. They should be shamed. If they are not shamed, if they just shrug it off, we are in trouble. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>